Welcome to the Been There Doing That podcast. I'm Robert Scrivener. And I'm Gayla Scrivener. We left the 9 to 5 grind, downsized, and our goal is to have freedom to live and to work from just about anywhere. We are glad you're here for the Been There Doing That podcast. Exciting podcast it is. It is. We got to talk to some fantastic people on the old interwebs. And we (laughs) (laughs) That's one way to put it. Yeah, that's one way to put it. Today's episode, we are sharing a conversation that we had with um, some overlanding friends of ours, Tim and Kelsey. From Dirt Sunrise. Yes. They can be uh, followed on dirtsunrise.com. And they have a YouTube channel, all of that. So Instagram, Facebook, they got it all. They do. And we met them through Overland Expo. And uh, I'd love to share this conversation that we had with them um, a few days ago. Okay, we, we should good. be recording. Did you hear? <laughs> does it say something on the other end? I yes, see a little does. record button. Yeah, that's uh, that's cool. Cause I never see it on the other end. But yeah, it's say, it oh, told shit. it told me that we was being recorded. Really? Well, that's a good thing to know. You can't sneakily yeah. record us. Dang it! No, it's it, it's letting <laughs> you know. Letting us know. Well, where are you guys at? Uh, San Clemente, at my parents' house. What part of that? Yeah, we're at my parents' house. Where's, is that in in Southern California? North of Camp, yeah, Southern California, north of Camp Pendleton. And uh, just south of, like, Mission Viejo. It's kind of like in between Los Angeles and uh, San Diego, isn't it? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Is it on the coast? Yep. Wow. It's not a bad place to be. Not a bad place to be. Well, the first, the first question um, I'd like to ask is tell us a little bit about you so that our audience can kind of get to know you. Sure. (laughs) Uh, We always hate talking about ourselves like that, but (laughs) I have, uh, just been working in this industry. I actually started working for a magazine. Um, before that, I was working at a coffee shop and I saw these cool trucks and I talked to an editor of the magazine and I sent an email to him just saying, I don't know what you guys do. I'm super interested in. And uh, do you guys need an intern? I'll sweep floors. I'll do whatever. I'm just curious. And he ended up getting me a, a job. And I just kind of learned from there. I was able to travel, meet a lot of people. Um, I'd be running the booth at Overland Expo for them. And that's where I actually met Tim. And then after I met Tim, I started teaching off-road driving uh, because he was an instructor there. And so that was kind of a natural change for me. And I really enjoyed teaching that. And then we both have had this dream to travel. so. Eventually, it was just natural that we decided, when are we going to do this? When are we going to go? Well, Kelsey, so you were working at a coffee shop and saw a, a magazine that you were really interested in that you asked to get a job? Yeah. And the, and the magazine was an overlanding magazine type thing? Yeah. Travel? It was actually Overland Journal. Oh, gotcha. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, Chris Collard was sitting in the coffee shop. Uh, late one night just working on a story and I saw his pictures and we started talking and I my mind was just blown it was like National Geographic and I was like this guy does this and so I just figured there's no harm in asking asking (laughs) so uh, did you travel before that or was it more of a dream or it was more of a dream for me I'd always had that interest in traveling uh, but my family really never traveled much as a kid Uh, We maybe went to Rocky Point a couple of times when I was younger, and that's about the extent of it. So it was really part of that interest was the 
traveling portion of it. Yeah. And, and Tim, how about you? I mean, have you always traveled? I mean, um, to a degree as a kid, we would do a lot of family trips to national parks or up into Canada. Um, that sort of family stuff for me, the dirt part came, um, I was probably 10 or 11. My parents shipped me off to, uh, outside Vegas. My uncle lived out there. He was a pilot, but he'd block together big blocks of time. I'd visit and then he'd teach me how to ride dirt bikes and, we'd get up at, you know, 4 a.m. or something and we'd be digging ditches and he had a landscaping company um, as well. So we'd be working all day. And then when it was too hot to work, he'd go, let's ride dirt bikes. I don't know if that makes any sense, but <laughs> that's what we did. And then I just fell in love with motorized sort of uh, travel uh, off road. Um, and from there, just kept riding dirt bikes, kept getting more into it. It was just so different than anything I'd done growing up. Um, then in college, I was very lucky. I did something called semester at sea and you essentially transfer from the school you're at to, I, I think it was university of Pittsburgh that technically owned the ship, but it's a ship that travels around and I got to go all through the Mediterranean and went to Russia, North Africa, um, a whole bunch of different countries in there. And you're taking college classes while you're doing it. So for me, that was the big world travel thing where I went, wow, okay, I want to see more of the world. Um, and then just do the cost of traveling. I didn't travel for quite a while. I just stuck with the off-roading, uh, explored Baja and all over the Western U S and that was kind of my comfort zone. Uh, it wasn't until we started talking more after Kelsey and I had met, you know, we keep teaching all these people. They come back each year and tell us about all the cool places they've been and where they're heading to next. Are we going to go or are we just going to be the people that talk about it? Um, and I think, when the fear that we'd end up being the people who talk about it was greater than the fear of, you know, getting rid of that stable job and going for it. That's when we decided to go. Well, yeah. And kind of about a year. Kind of the, the, the wish of shoulda, coulda, if I only had a. Yeah, people. exactly. Right. And I don't want to, I mean, there's always gonna be a few of those I'm sure in life, but uh, if there's a big one, you want to try to not have to say what it could and so yeah. your people can follow you on uh, your YouTube channel and your website, Dirt Sunrise. Um, but tell us a little bit, because we know, because we follow you, and that's kind of how we came to um, meet you, is that we followed you on social, and we kind of creeped up on you at Overland and said, hey, can we take a film picture of you? <laughs> And, um, but you downsized and you've been traveling down South, South America, Mexico and South America. Tell us a little bit about that. Uh, we're looking at each other. Who <laughs> talked first? Um, yeah, we actually, that photo that you took, Robert was the last photo, I think of us sort of still in our normal lives. We'd already quit our jobs at that point and we knew we were heading out. But um, it's, it's a good photo, but it was neat to look back and see and go, well, that's kind of the end of us doing that and uh, the, the beginning of us heading on this big trip. So from Overland Expo last year, West, uh, we hit the road and started in Baja, sort of familiar territory, and got to explore it much further and deeper than we ever had because we had time. And then went over to mainland Mexico and just kept heading south and you know, six months later, we were probably in Costa Rica by six months in, something like that. Yeah. And shipped from Panama to Colombia and then just kept on going. Uh, right now, the truck's in Lima, Peru. Uh, thanks to a buddy who works for Marriott, uh, we could not find a place to store the truck. It was too tall. The garages are very short in uh, Peru. And uh, he reached out to the manager of the, the Marriott in Lima. And sure enough, we got uh, permission to park it down beneath uh, the uh, hotel so we can't afford the hotel but we can uh, afford the free parking beneath it <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's where we're at as of now and we're trying to make videos each week Kelsey's really doing the, the work and the brunt of that I'm trying to help gather enough good video to make the videos but she does all the editing and spends not quite a full-time job per week but um, gosh at least 15 hours or something each week yeah. editing. 
it's a lot of time, but it's something that I've always enjoyed doing. Um, and definitely pushes me to grow when you have a, a deadline and, and something that you're working towards each week. So that, that is, been, that is true. Yeah. It's been a lot of fun. It's, it's always tough, but it's something that I really enjoy. And we decided to do the videos to kind of bring family and friends along so that they could see why we're doing this and what we're seeing. And it's not as dangerous as everyone thinks and people are friendly. Well, and that's, yes. uh, I mean, Kelsey, would you have made a trip like this on your own or does it? I wish I could say yes, but we've talked about that a lot. I don't know that I would have had the guts. I mean, even just leaving took a lot of, you know, each of us going, are we crazy? Should we do this? And having that other person to go, no, I want to do this too. And so we kind of, at the times when I'm weak, Tim was stronger and, you know, opposite so that was a huge help and then on the road now that I've done it I think maybe I would feel more comfortable doing it uh alone but no I don't think I would have ever jumped in and done it by myself the same goes for me even though I had done some more international travel the idea that you're just going to pick up and go it uh, that was by far the hardest part of this whole trip is going wow I'm really going to sell you know this couch or something it, it, it's silly and small but you go seems kind of uh, definitive. Once I sell all this stuff off and I rent my house, I mean, there's a person who's going to live in my house. I better, I actually, I really have to go, you know, this is real. Um, as silly as it seems, that was the hardest part of the whole thing. Well, and, and I, following your videos and you've gone to some remarkable places, but quite frankly, my comfort zone isn't there to go to South America <laughs> yet. But I would think, I mean, now knowing your your world travel, Tim, it's like, well, boy, that makes sense. You had that little bit of background to give you more courage because neither Robert or I have world travel. But but anyway, I Robert and I are not uh, world travelers. Neither one of us have experience in that. So when we look at, well, at least I speaking for me, when I look at your videos, like, oh my gosh, you guys are so brave. But you say, um, you know, you, you meet so many friendly people and you've got a lot of connections because I hear you all the time saying, oh, you got to go see my friend in so-and-so. And, and, and you, you meet people through other people. How yeah, absolutely. We've been really lucky. I mean, I think being involved in the Overland world before we left and working with um, Overland Expo has given us so many great connections of other travelers who, you know, a lot of times it's a friend of a friend that we meet and then they become friends and we meet their friends. And so uh, it's kind of been a neat network that way um, that we didn't even realize what an asset that was, I think, before we left. Yeah. And I think for us, we try and in the videos and just in general demystify this whole overlanding thing, especially in foreign countries, people say, Oh, it must've been, difficult doing this or that. Yeah. You're, you don't know the rules in all these countries. You don't know the etiquette. You don't know what a real rule is and when somebody's trying to shake you down a little bit. So there are challenges, but in general, it's just like traveling in the U S everyone's friendly. Everyone wants to help you. Um, you know, there's less theft and left little petty crimes than in the U S. Um, a lot of folks we've known have traveled around for a year or five and when they got back to the U.S. is when their truck got robbed. So I think a lot of people over mystify it, I think. Like it's not, I don't have the skill set. I don't have the security set up for my truck. And really we have no security setup. We don't have any big plan of things bad happen. I mean, if a real bad dude wants us, wants our truck, our money, or to hurt us, it's going to happen, whether it's here in the U.S. or anywhere else. And so for us, it's been one of those things that we meet all these nice people as we go. Some have been hookups before we left. You know, somebody said, you got to talk to Byron in Guatemala, which is one of our favorite ones. That's where we stored our truck when we came back for Expo East. But so many of the others are just, we're driving down dirt roads, frustrated. We can't find a place to camp. Um, everything seems fenced off. And a, a local indigenous guy just says, hey, can I help you guys out? Why don't you camp up? on this farm where I work. 
And now you've got a new friend in that country and a contact and he can introduce you to the next contact and the next one. Um, it just works out more often than you ever think it would. Did you have to, I mean, do you know the language or are there challenges with that? Oh, there's definitely challenges. Um, one of the reasons I was super excited to travel through Mexico and Central and South America was I had been really passionate about the language when I was, you know, late high school, early college, and I had a tutor and I, I just loved the language. And of course, I've lost all of that, you know, and people, oh, it'll come back real quick. So I had a decent base, but I am far from being good at Spanish, I would say. <laughs> and I'm just below by. mediocre. Yeah. Uh, but the problem we found is if you speak sort of uh, formal Spanish, what you were taught in school, what flashcards will teach you, what the apps will teach you, that works in the bigger cities where people are school educated, but you get into the mountains and it's like getting into the deep south up in some mountain somewhere, maybe 60% of a sentence is slang and you go, I have no idea what they just said. They said it was such a thick accent that I have no idea what was just said. And you're just both looking at each other. They don't understand what you're saying. You don't understand what they're saying. And you're pretty sure you're speaking Spanish, but it's, it's not making any sense. So there's, there's always going to be challenges, I think. But in the end, um, we're lucky that we're in countries where at least we know some. Yeah. If in the future we end up in Mongolia or somewhere, we're not going to have a shot. It's <laughs> going to be all hand signals. And, uh, but that works. You know, we, we've gotten really good at getting our points across. Trying to show mutual respect is just a, a way you look at someone and the way you treat them. And it always seems to, to work out. Yeah. Yeah. It was definitely something that I had to learn, especially being a bit of a perfectionist of wanting to be able to speak this perfect sentence and like get it out. And so because I you know didn't know one word or something, I wouldn't say anything. And so I've learned to just go for it. <laughs> it's not going to sound great. It might be wrong. But people are more likely to open up to you and help you and talk to you when you're open and, and are willing to talk to them, even if you might sound stupid. <laughs> yeah, that, that is awesome. Do you, um, well, Robert, do you have any questions? Because I've overtaken. Well, <laughs> I, I, do have a, I do have a question. <clears throat> You've been all these uh, remote, beautiful places, and you traveled so far, and what has been your biggest challenge that you've had to overcome so far during your whole travels? Um, it's tough because from day to day we might answer differently, but one that's consistent is the difficulty of not knowing anything. When we flew back uh, almost three months ago for our you know, time to come home and work and take a break from the road, I saw Catalina Island out the window of the plane. I went, I know that. I know where to get food there. I know where you're allowed to camp. I know what the fee is to do this or that are. I knew everything about it. And it was the first thing I knew uh, in almost a year of traveling. And I realized how easy everything is when you sort of know where to go and what to do and who to talk to. Uh, so for us, the biggest challenge is nothing is known. Every day is new. Every day you camp somewhere and you go, I hope this is okay. I think this is all right. Um, and you just don't know. Sometimes people walk up truck and say, hey, uh, you're on my ranch. Oh, I didn't see a fence or a sign. Uh, or any of the indications I'd look for here in the U.S., sorry about that. And usually they'll be happy to let you stay, but you just don't know what you're doing. You're kind of fumbling in the dark. Uh, you get into a city, and there's some traffic laws you've never heard of or seen before. Uh, you don't know where to go get food. You don't know what a bad part of town is. It's like showing up in whatever big city you, you picture, L.A. or Detroit or somewhere, and fumbling your way into the worst part of town and going, well, I didn't know this was the worst part of town. Oops. So everything's unknown. So for us, we're just getting better at trying to stay in the same spot a few days because then at least you go, okay, that canyon leads over here. I hiked that yesterday. Uh, down that wash over there is some water. We can, we can pump that through our filter and have fresh water. Um, I know we're allowed to stay here. We've met some other travelers. They were here for a week, so we know it's okay and it's safe. But you know, you're, you're learning every single day and nothing is taken for granted. And that's just exhausting mentally and, uh, and physically. It's great, but it's, it is one of those things I didn't have any concept of because when we do a, even a seven day trip to Baja, there's a lot of unknowns where we're going to end up, but I had a general route mapped out certain spots I wanted to check out. Um, it was very familiar actually. 
uh, and every trip was, even unknown areas in Utah or wherever we went. There was a lot of known factors, um, where to get gas, what to do if you broke down, and none of that's known. It's, it's all new every day. Yeah, I think it's been a surprise how much we, in a sense, like routine, right? When we left, we're thinking, oh, we're going to leave this routine. I don't have to go into a job every day. And, and I don't like that part of a routine, but you do realize how nice a routine is to have to know you're going to get up and I can go get coffee here. And if I want to walk to the store, I know which stores and what they have. And um, so, yeah, that lack of routine has definitely been harder than I expected it to be. Well, you're trading one challenge for another challenge, basically. Yeah. The way I see it. (laughs) But it feels, I I bet you it feels really good when you can overcome, you know, the the challenges. It makes the unfamiliar familiar. And it's like, you look back on it, it's like, man, we did this. Yeah. And then there's still more to come. Yeah. And I think we get better at it, uh, rolling with the punches like that, where you go, you know, I'm just going to camp here. If somebody doesn't want me here, they'll let us know. Um, instead of fretting about the whole night, not sleeping a few nights in a row, uh, trying to do everything perfectly, you're just not going to. It's going to work out however it's going to work out. And I think we're getting better at going with the flow. But um, I think anyone who likes off-roading, motorcycles, these are all control freaked kind of things. <laughs> and so here we are on the road in all these foreign countries, just to the will of the people around us and the countryside, the weather we're learning a lot better to just go with it and go, well, I guess we're not camping here or, you know, I'm just going to set up camp and we'll see how it goes. Well, now you downsize or your, your house that you had, it's a rental property now. Um, Yep. So we rented it for a year and just got confirmation yesterday. So we're really excited that, um, because the year's up. Yeah. About 15 days. She moved in last year from now. And she just said that she's going to stay through late January. So we're at least good until then. And so you're, you're, you didn't sell your property. You've got that as rental. And then you downsized, so you didn't have as much stuff. Yeah. But how do you earn a living and travel? It's, for us, it was all the front end. It was the saving. And we both, thankfully, are savers. So... I know how difficult can be for folks in a relationship where one's a spender, one's a saver. We thankfully were both savers. And then as soon as we had an inkling, we wanted to do this, we ratcheted it up to a whole new level. Um, We've always been the type that if there's a weekend or vacation days where we could make money versus spend it, we'll make it. So we would map trails for the forest service and BLM. We would teach any chance we got all these off-road skills, anything we could do to make extra money. We'd buy motorcycles that needed you know, light fixing up, carbs cleaned out and resell them for some money. So that for us was really the way we were able to say, I think we could do this for a year. And then on the road, a lot of people have budgets and, you know, calculate everything to the day and how much you're spending. And we just decided let's spend as little as possible. And if we have a budget, we'll just spend up to it. And then in countries where it's expensive, we're just going to blow it out of the water and overspend above a budget. So let's not worry about a budget. Let's just spend as little as possible. We know after two weeks in the Paten in Guatemala and you've got maybe not hundreds of mosquito bites, but it seems like it. And you're, you, it's humid. You sweat from the moment you wake up. You sweat while you sleep. It's beautiful, but a little miserable. When we look at each other and say, yeah, I want to get an Airbnb with a shower and feel human again, we do it. Um, but we do try and wait as long as we can. But we tend to at the same time have the same enough you know moment where we look at each other all right yeah let's research that next big town and in two days we'll be there and we'll have something to look forward to and get a shower we're due and then in drier climates like a baja or now that now in south america it's dry it's pretty sunny it's not too hot so we've just been great for weeks at a time or even over a month and go yeah i'm good uh let's just go jump in the ocean or in that river with a bar of soap and so we've been able to travel more cheaply than we had planned we would and at the end of a year we haven't spent I don't think we spent half of what we expected to yeah that's awesome and then you come back like he's been back for what three months to yeah. do your overland training you were at overland expo and you're up in Canada and 
and all? Yeah, we, the last trip home was like 15 days and we definitely regret doing such a short one. So that was for Overland Expo East. They paid for the flights back. So it was kind of one of those, hey, why wouldn't we go back, make money? If there's anything we need to buy that you can't find down here, we'll get that and then we'll fly back to the truck. And it was basically working straight, you know, you guys saw what it was like, the mud pit, right? And you're <laughs> yeah. soaked in icy mud for 15 days. So you get back to the truck exhausted and you go, what just happened? But it was for money, so it was worth it. It paid for at least three months of travel, I think, to yeah. come home for 15 days. And then this trip, we said, look, let's have more time so we can relax, have a little more fun. And so we did three months. And most of the three months was going to be work, but we're going to have some days in between. But as the, the military training work that I do, very stereotypical government, sometimes it's there, sometimes it falls through. So the entire first month of work fell through. So we actually had, on the plus side, it, it was stressful because you're home and it's expensive in the United States, but we had some time to relax and just be home, you know, see friends and family. We did a road trip in our old FJ40 and camped and um, as silly as it sounds that we decided to go camping on our vacation from our camping trip. <laughs> you know, in the U.S., you know all the rules. It was so easy. It was, ah, oh, yeah, I know there's a hot springs down here, and I know this trail, and you know, I know someone in this town. We can just call them up, and we'll pop in and say hello. So we we went and did that. So this trip home's been probably too long, but we really wanted to work a lot and see how much we could earn to pay for this trip. So we did the Northwest Overland Rally, the BC or British Columbia Overland Rally. I did a month straight of military training where you you do not have a day off. Uh, you don't even really have an hour. You sleep when you can't stand up anymore, and then you get up and do it again. And uh, it's exhausting. But between all those things and over the next Bow West, we're able to earn enough that I think, I don't know how long it'll last because, I mean, you can blow a transmission tomorrow and, or an engine, and that's going to eat up all of it. But assuming we keep going like we have been, and Argentina and Chile aren't too expensive, I know they're more expensive than most of the countries we've been in. We think we've got another eight months or something of traveling we could do. Yeah, it also worked out to take a break too, because as we head further south, it's going to be pretty cold right now. So we either had to hurry up and get down there, which we didn't want to do. So it made sense to kind of take this time to take a break and hopefully miss some of the cold down there as well. So you'll be getting, when are you going back? We're going back in five days, six days. Yeah, something like that. And so it'll be winter time down there. So we're still so close to the equator. It shouldn't be that big of a difference. It's interesting when you ask people that live in that part of the world, uh, what winter's like, they just nod and go about like this. <laughs> you go, <"Well, laughs> cause you realize, yeah, I guess that makes sense. Right. But, uh, we're so used to seasons changing that, um, they'll say, Oh, well, it's a little more rain, but the same temp or it's about two Celsius warmer or something. So where we're at shouldn't be too different. So we're going to enjoy exploring Peru some more head off into possibly a little bit of Brazil and the Amazon there and do a muddy track that takes us through the jungle and dumps us into Bolivia. And then Bolivia should be great as well. Really high elevations. So it might be cold because of the elevation, but it shouldn't be cold necessarily just because of winter versus summer. It's from there south that we're trying to stall a little bit and not get there too quickly because uh, Patagonia in winter, I'm sure is beautiful, but the folks we've seen who didn't come home who continued on in their trip and were hitting the southern tip of South America in the dead of winter. Not that they weren't having a good time, but man, they looked cold and they were sure complaining about it a lot. So, <laughs> so, you, so around November, December here where it's cold, way down south, way down south is, <laughs> is going to be warmer. Um, yep. That's kind of what you're shooting for. Exactly. Yeah. So that's kind of what we're thinking time frame wise is, that time of year into January, February will be a great time to be down there and making our plans to head back north, however we do it. We, we really have no idea. We've done research and just asked other people we've met on the road, all right, where'd you ship out of or where are you planning to ship out of? And um, kind of letting all those ruminate. And when we get down there, we'll figure out what we're going to do. You have come up to your year because I remember you were saying, we're going to do this for a year. But you're kind of, to me, it's like you're, just beginning your trip, your journey, even though you don't have like a plan after you get to the, the mm -hmm. tip, do you, do you have plans for, for stopping this epic trip? Or are you going to try to commit for another year of living and working kind of this way? I think 
it's always going to be money dependent for us, but the idea and the plan is, yeah, we don't want to stop. I think for now, at least until February or March, we're going to be traveling unless something happens. Beyond that, we'd like to keep it going as well, but I don't know how much we need to stop and work to make that happen. And I don't know where we're going to head next. It kind of depends on what opportunities are out there. And so we have a friend whose truck is in uh, South Africa and it needs to leave a certain country by a certain date and get to another one. Uh, his import permits up. And so maybe we'll go move that truck for him. He's offered, maybe he'll need that done. So, Hey, okay. That'd be a great way to get into a country and not have to worry about the vehicle part of the, the trip. You know, we have friends in Australia keep saying, come down and visit. There's a truck you could borrow. So it's still really expensive. It's still something we got to work and save up for, but yeah, all we can think about now is where's next and where do you want to go and what do you want to see? Yeah. I think it's interesting from the beginning we kind of viewed what we're doing as a lifestyle change, not just a trip or a vacation, which I think is hard for the average person to wrap their head around because they're picturing us sitting on beaches, drinking, you know, margaritas all day long, every day. And we certainly can't complain about our lifestyle, but like we said, you, you change uh, kind of the struggles that you're dealing with. And so we, we view this as hopefully a lifestyle change. And we weren't really sure what that meant when we left, you know, whether or not once this trip is over, it just means that we have different priorities in our careers that we go back to or something. But yeah, I think that's the way we're looking at it is, is a, a lifestyle change. Yeah, we, well, most of the people we've met while traveling are doing this as their big trip, their big blowout. You know, some are really young and are doing it between, you know, high school and college or just after college before they get a career and things like that. And then others are retired and they've got a lot of money saved up and they're going to nice restaurants, nice hotels, and we could do that, but it's going to be a much shorter trip. And so for us, we just aren't looking at it like that. We're trying to live truly on the road. Just like at home, you know, we try and go to a farmer's market and buy a ton of vegetables. You'll buy bags and bags, and the total will be a dollar or two dollars for enough veggies for and a week or yeah. more. And so if you're eating like that, you realize you can extend this trip quite a bit uh, versus going to restaurants and uh, paying for tours and guides to take you up mountains. We're really just trying to explore as long as we can, but we're trying to look at it differently than a, a trip where you know there's an end date, so you might as well spend all the money you have in your pocket. Yeah, when we started our, I mean, it is a lifestyle change, and, and we've chosen our lifestyle to, to create a company or create a business, a virtual assistant business that we could work from anywhere and so creating that ecosystem that we're not geographically tied yeah. and, and moving away from a traditional job, at least for me, corporate wise is like, ah, uh, it's, it's a big leap, but yeah. every day it gets a little bit easier. And it's like, every day is like, we, we want to be able to be more nomadic than what we are, but you work up to it. Yeah. And everyone has their, I guess, style in doing mm -hmm. so, but shifting in the way that you travel and, and earn money and, and explore, it is such a mind shift and perspective change. Does, does your friends and family think you're crazy or are they real supportive? <laughs> I'm going to go with crazy. Yeah. I think the majority <laughs> thinks we're crazy. Yeah. It's, it's interesting because you meet people on the road from other countries, some from the U S but primarily other countries who they're like, of course they're all supportive and everyone's super excited and um, wants us to go more and further and, and keep going. And not that our, our friends and family aren't supportive, but it's a different way of thinking. It's okay. You know, get this out of your system. And um, oof, you know, I'm worried for you guys. I'm just hope everything's okay. When are you getting home again? So it's just a different way of thinking. I think um, so. It, it's been interesting having that pull back to normal life and you kind of feel like the world, the American world wants you to come home, get a corporate job and sit in your cubicle. And that's the best, safest thing you could do. Um, so it's been interesting, but like what you guys are doing for us, when we get back our next leap, which may not seem like it'd be a leap because we're traveling in all these foreign places, but to maintain it, to not fall back into, you know, I got a job offer to go back and do what I used to do let's just go back and sit in offices. That's the easiest. We'll, you know, we'll just do it to say, no, we're going to come home. We're going to 
what are we going to have as our base? Are we going to get an old sprinter and try and build it out? Are we going to, you know, just keep goose and have a little trailer with a couple mountain bikes or bikes on it? And can we live out of that? Are we going to be happy with that? And do the training and all the other things we've done on as side jobs for, you know, 15 years. Are we going to make those our full time? Or are we going to fall back into the, the easy way, I think, but the less maybe happy way of just doing what everyone else does in the U.S.? Uh, so our biggest goal when we get back would be to try and avoid that and say, no, don't fall into it. It's just like you said, it's scarier. It's, it's sometimes tougher to have that independence, but to work at it and just pursue that. And so you don't, so you feel like you're in control of your life. You have that freedom of movement. Yeah. It's, it's hard for me to, you know, want to go back. I had different offers here and there throughout the years. And it's like, no. Yes, that's the easy way, but it feels so stifling and yeah. like I'm dying inside a little bit. It's like, yeah. No, yeah, I just can't do that. Even though, I mean, starting your, your own business is hard enough, even if you're just staying stationary, but yeah. learning all this stuff for the potential out there and you're with your travels and, and the trainings that you do, it, it's so exciting that you're priming yourself up for a, a virtual business. And I see the potential. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I see that you can do it. It's um, good that someone does. <laughs> but, you know, we go to, to Overland Expo and we volunteer uh, at it. We go there because, you know, we are around people that don't think we're so crazy. Yeah. They, yeah, it's great to have that community. And that is one of the things that as we were getting ready to leave to having those people, that feedback was crucial because otherwise all the other feedback you're getting is this is wrong and you're crazy and it's not safe. And you start to go, is it? <laughs> yeah, you see you the words, you know, we have very encouraging um, family and friends, but they may say, yay yay you know they're cheering but there's that underlying tone it's like like you said when are you coming home mm -hmm. when are you going to do the normal thing yep. and at at overland when you're surrounded by folks and that energy that it's just like okay we don't have to justify ourselves we can just go in and start talking about the stuff and and planning for the future and get the ex excitement going yeah yep. Because it's a challenge just to keep on going. But, you know, regular life is a challenge. Why not have a challenge of, of seeing, of seeing yeah. sights, you know, and, and being with nature? And yeah. Yeah. And it really feels like it's challenging, right? Because every day, like we're saying, we don't have the routine. But in a sense, it gives me that feeling of like, I don't know, when you're in school and learning and your brain is just like eating it up and it, it's growing and you're always learning and thinking and that's exhausting, but it also feels great. And uh, that's something that I definitely get on the road that I don't always in normal life. Mm -hmm. And just the feeling of accomplishment. Yeah. It's like, oh, I can't believe we, you know, you look back at your Instagram feed and see where you've gone and what you've done. And it's like, Oh, that's pretty cool. <laughs> Look at your videos. I mean, we do our videos just for ourselves because we are like, Oh, that's pretty cool. And yeah. Then it's kind of cool when other people think it's cool too. Right. It's exactly. We more than once have gone back and watched one of the early videos, even from when we traveled, you know, in the U S and we had started trying to do these videos or we'll look at a one from Baja. We'll look at one from hanging out in Guatemala where we met so many nice people. And yeah, it's, it's exactly that feeling of, wow, we did that. And it's so funny to, to look back on what may only be six months ago and go, wow, we really did go there. Huh. Um, it's, it it's, sounds crazy to say because <laughs> we're the ones there, but the videos are nice to look back on your own adventures and go, you know what, we can do this because look what we did not that long ago. Speaking of doing that, uh, you ever been in a, like a tight spot and said, oh my gosh, uh, I shouldn't have done that? A few times. <laughs> I mean, what we've done that? it. What was your, what was your biggest one that you, you know, you shouldn't have done or 
the biggest uh, tight spot you've been in? I think there's a couple different types, like the self put in where you've uh, taken a trail or you've chosen a line or something like that off roading and you're all alone. We're always alone generally. And we're leaving a campsite still in Mexico, I think. And we, the front left tire, the right rear fell into a, you know, four foot uh, water uh, erosion ditch. And then the left front went skyward. It was just muddy. I was trying to avoid sliding into it. And then I gave it a little more gas to see if it would walk the nose back down and it didn't, it just went higher. And then you just go, okay, well, I'm not moving here. Uh, we're about to roll our home. So we'll sit tight and you can pull winch line. I can't stop mashing this brake pedal. And you realize you could have just ended the trip, maybe really hurt yourself too, but at the very least ended the trip and stuff like that. So you, you just realize that these little decisions become very important at times. In terms of people or scary moments, we really haven't had any. We haven't had any theft, no pickpocketing. I'm sure I'm jinxing myself now, but you know, the scariest moment was, and I've been pulled over in Mexico many times, but in Mexico city, these cops had such absolute power. I mean, there's people in traffic, barely moving next to us all watching. So they, they couldn't care less. It's not like, gosh, I hope no one in a car sees that I'm trying to rip these people off and just yells at me or stops. They're like, no, we've got this. We know we have absolute power. And there's something very scary about that. Somebody with just complete power in broad daylight in the middle of Mexico city traffic saying, you're going to give me 450 bucks period. Go, but we didn't do anything. Well, you're not supposed to be driving today with that license plate. There's, if you look up Mexico city um, emissions and plate, they, they have certain plates that can drive on certain days in the city to cut down on traffic and emissions. So we'd researched it all. And I said, no, no, I think you mean if, if it ended in a, you know, whatever it was, a T through such and such, then I couldn't be driving today. But ours ends in a zero, which is okay today, but not okay tomorrow. And he's, oh, okay, shoot, they, they researched that. Uh, well, you tinted windows <laughs> or you have no front plate, you know, and I had to go through, no, as an imported vehicle, I just have to comply to the laws of my country and state. Um, you know, you're right. If I were a Mexican citizen, though, I would need that plate. Oh, okay. They researched that. And you just knew that they were going to take from you whatever they wanted. Finally, in the end, like every time we're in a bad situation, somebody comes out of the woodwork to help. And it was our Airbnb host for that night. I call him and I say, Hey, I know this has nothing to do with Airbnb. I know that me staying at your place is not imply that you need to help me in a, a situation with police, but these guys are yelling. They're they got a flatbed truck. They're going to take our truck from us. They're going to do whatever they got to do to get a bunch of money from us. And at the very least, if they can't get money, then they'll just take something of ours. Uh, it's getting scary. And I handed the phone over to the cops and he yelled at them for a good 20 minutes. And, um, <laughs> you know, by the end of that, they realized, shoot, this guy might be able to know who we are. I noticed our move now since this day forward has been video the cops a little bit. And if they say, you're not allowed to video me, say, okay, we'll shut it off. We make YouTube videos. You know, that's our, that's our work. And we're trying to get people to visit your country. So there's a little guilt there. And then also the fact that they're now on film, they start thinking, gosh, that wouldn't look good if I were online, you know, doing this. So maybe they shouldn't let them go. So all those combination of factors and they let us go eventually. But I think that was the scariest time, right? just being so powerless. You know, anybody who's been harassed by somebody of power, you know, at home here in the U S knows a little bit of that feeling, but something about the foreign country going, I don't think there's going to be any retribution for them. I think they really do have absolute power. It made it even more scary. Uh, so that was the scariest moment, but no life or health was threatened. It was just a moment of realizing I don't want to be here right now. I don't have any power or any say in the situation. So for us, those are kind of the, the two worst, but there's a lot of different off-roading ones where you, you go down a track and then the tires sink in up to the axles and you go, just remember, we know what we're doing. You know, we need to get this truck turned around in this soup and then winch our way out. It's going to be three or four or five hours of work. But if we just work methodically like it's a class, we've got this. That's where that knowledge does come in very handy. But you it's know. so funny, the anxiety of like going down a track and going, oh, this could be bad. We could get stuck. Or, And then as soon as it happens, it doesn't seem so bad because you you don't have that option to be worrying about it you're actually doing something about it and so even though it's it sucks I still kind of love those moments where then you jump into action and we're lucky that we're able to work well as a team and you just make it happen and then after that it feels so good you you know the being able to work as a team and getting through something that's tough it's just a neat feeling actually 
Not that I'm wishing to be stuck all the time. <laughs> <laughs> well, and the, the off-roading, I mean, that that is what you train is the off-roading skills. And so, so you're experienced in that it, and, and your problem solving skills in that area, you're, you're challenged with that. Not that you'd put yourself in that situation because you're moving your home. You don't want right. to roll it or anything like that. Robert is skilled in, in off-roading. Me, not so much. Not at all. <laughs> I take direction very well. <laughs> so what do you, that she does. What do you, and, and when we were uh, in Colorado on our way back home from Overland, there was a place that Robert walked ahead, came back and he said, prepare to get dirty. And I was just like, <laughs> okay, what do I need to do? <laughs> so I was like, let me get on different shoes. We're in the middle of nowhere. So I was like, let me change clothes because I can, I'm prepared to get bring whatever we have. So, yeah. Um, yeah, that's awesome. Nothing to winch to is a muddy single track going down the side of a, a 8,000 foot hill and uh, nowhere to really turn around. Nothing to winch to. And it was sticky, sticky, sticky Ugh. mud. I hate mud. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I do too. And uh, well, we made things. it out of it. Slow down and work through it. There's always a way. And yeah. I think if you work together as a team and, you know, taking direction and being able to just calmly take the next step and the next step is, is the biggest part. Any of the fancy tools and the recovery toys, all that stuff isn't as important as, okay, we got a shovel and we got some hours. We'll find a way out of this. We just need to methodically work through it. And um, I would say, you know, cause people, we do an overlanding one-on-one class kind of, you know, distilling it down. What do you really need? What do you, really need to go and do this. And the answer is not much, but usually say a shovel and a couple hours of manual labor fixes most problems uh, off-road. Yeah. We did not have any uh, max tracks or any traction aid or anything like that. All we had was uh, a couple of RV leveling blocks that were plastic. <laughs> nice. And we'd throw those down in the mud every so often and get traction from them and, and got to where I could turn it around and head back out. Yeah. And That's I simple. It, Robert, I know, was probably had more anxiety than I had. I just knew that it's all going to take take care of itself. We don't have a schedule, you, you know, prepare. It was early in the day. And so we had all this daylight hours. And then I, I had realized then it's like, you know, really, Robert's been after me for to get a ham license and I haven't done that yet but I really do need to know how to use two meter to for an emergency mm -hmm. I'm thinking you know and and so things like that puts puts skills into perspective that perhaps I need to learn this just um, to be a little bit better so if there is a situation I could help uh, in some way, because I thought, well, what if I don't know how I'd get out of there without Robert's knowledge, honestly. Yeah, yeah that's, I mean, I could I mean, walk and and I knew where the campground was. I could walk for right. miles and that that's what I do, which is fine. But yeah, I, I love it's one of my passions is to to get women because generally the guys are the ones that are more into all the gear and what it all does. and and that's great and they enjoy that a lot more than women normally do but to get that comfort you know with what would you do in this situation and what do all the buttons do in the vehicle and how does four-wheel drive work and it's so much fun to teach that to the women because they do enjoy going out but they might not you know know the ratio of the winch pulling this and that but do they know if it works and it's safe and I love kind of sharing that with women because then they're so much more excited. They don't feel like <laughs> they're trapped in this vehicle and have no way out. Yeah. And then I feel, I mean, we, I feel that it's, it's important to, to know, even though I know enough to get out of a situation or, or be of an asset instead of, you know, freaking out at a situation. Like yeah. I, like I said, I, I take direction well because I need 
that's where Robert knows what to yeah. do and you're calm <laughs> and stay calm. And, and, um, but then we have our roles when we have, when we're out camping and on the road road, we have, we've just, I do certain things. He do does other things. And, mm-hmm. and we fall into that comfort level, but I also ask him a lot of questions not to just because I, I don't know mechanics of a vehicle, nor do I think I will ever, you know, take, take out any, what did you take out the drive shaft of the Jeep on our way back? And I was like, <laughs> not that I would do that. But yeah. I asked yeah. him a lot of questions. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. We we're kind of the same, you know, you fall into what you like doing and maybe what you are better at doing. Uh, but I still think it's important to maybe not know how to pull a drive shaft, but <laughs> you know, if, as long as you know how to drive and you might not choose to drive most of the time, but to have that skill is important. Well, we always talk about, we do much harder trails together than we do alone, which is the inverse. I feel like for a lot of couples, they say, well, when, when uh, my spouse is along, whichever one's not as into it, um, we stick to the easier trails and uh, they don't really like the, the scarier stuff or getting tippy. And if they're trained up to be a good spotter, they can spot you through stuff you couldn't drive through without maybe putting a rock into the door or into the oil pan or skid plate, something. And so as soon as you're both able to spot and uh, do those tasks, we find that we're able to get through tougher stuff more easily together than we would if I was just out wheeling alone. Yeah, that is true. Yeah. And, and the, the wheeling closer to home, getting the practice for tough situations where you're, you're not going to want to go on these tough trails out on the road because that's your home too. You don't want your daily driver to, to be toast. You, you want to take care of it, but things happen. The maps may not be as um, detailed as what you thought they should be. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) That's for true, Gayla. (laughs) <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> mm, yeah. Well, this road goes through, doesn't it? No, yeah. it doesn't. It, it's <laughs> it it's does. the same color as this semi-paved road. Yeah, right. It looks so <laughs> promising. That's an interesting one, too, because in the U.S., you kind of get used to reading these topos and the Google Earth bird's eye view and guesstimating. This one goes through. Maybe that one doesn't. I think this is pretty likely to make it. And in these other countries, there's just not that level of detail. So every every road you take, you're kind of going, I have no idea. And, you know, pretty often it doesn't go. <laughs> yeah, or there's been a rock slide yeah. or, you know, there's a truck that's stuck in the middle of the road or something. Yeah. Hmm. Well, we've taken up um, a lot of your time and we really, really appreciate you talking with us today. And I would love for you to share with folks how people can follow you, follow your travels. Sure. You can, uh, our website links to everything. So it's just dirtsunrise.com and on Instagram, dirt sunrise on YouTube, dirt sunrise. <laughs> so it's all, you can just look up dirt, dirt sunrise. And if you can't find us, just go to that website and we have links to everything there. Yeah. We try and keep our little Garmin GPS on, um, where we're at. So if you're just curious what we're up to and stuff, uh, you can follow along and see, where we're at. And then anytime we have service, we try and post, we try and post weekly on Fridays, a new video. And there's been plenty of times though, that because of service that ends up being Saturday or Sunday or something like that. But, yeah. but the general schedule we try to keep up with over the last year is a weekly video and it's lagging a couple of months behind just because of the time it takes to edit it all put it together. Um, and that's, yeah, we're trying to be more live update on Instagram. Um, you know, if we have service, post a photo of what we're doing that day or the trail we're on but um the videos are probably the best way and uh just knowing that we're a little bit behind yeah yeah they're i I love your videos and i get a a lot of ideas and i i love how you narrate over the footage you just make the story go you know i have a lot to learn (laughs) me too i'm always learning (laughs) and i don't i i don't know why because Robert does all the video videography and, and all of that, but I don't know why he wants me to narrate over. It's like, y- you can do it, Robert. I like it's your voice. Nice voice. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> I, I don't have a voice for radio. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you do. I, that's how I feel. I do all the singing stuff. I'd rather you listen know? to Kelsey than, than uh, my voice. So. <laughs> but do you have any uh, last advice for folks that may want to do this? I think if you're serious about it, just put a date on the calendar and, uh, and you got to stick to it and just go. Um, we've seen people with immensely bigger budgets than us and immensely smaller where they have almost nothing and they're doing it and it's inspirational. But the hardest thing is just going. Uh, you can always stop, turn around and come home. But the, taking the time to sell off a lot of your life, rent your home if you want to keep it, um, whatever you're going to do, that's the hardest part is leaving uh, when people say you're crazy or you're going to die or whatever is going to happen, just going. And then remembering that in a month you could just turn around and come back. Um, it's not a big deal, but so many people I feel like say they're going to go one day. We have people all the time write to us saying, I'm loving watching your videos. One day I'm going to go. And I'm sure some of them will, but I almost want to reach out and call them and say, Hey, <laughs> if you're serious about this, let's talk about it. When are you going to go? Let's, can we help? because I know the tendency is to say someday we'll go and then uh, someday it's too late. Yeah. Finding that community of people that can support your craziness is helpful on uh, getting out of normal. I think. I have found out that uh, if Gala puts it on the calendar, it's going to happen. Yeah. I like it. So it's stuff is on the calendar for us. Yeah. yeah. That's the same thing. As soon as we put a date, uh, it's about a year and a month out. We said, okay, next year at the end of Overland Expo would be a logical time to go. Let's do it. And we were within about two weeks of that date, I think. Yeah. So it is important. And when we get back to also keep say, the date on the calendar. <laughs> yeah. To when we're going to go again. Um, and then mm -hmm. just like you guys are doing, stick to living a more independent and uh, free life. Mm -hmm. And those events, it's been for the last few years committing to oh, we're making a commitment to volunteer at Overland. Mm -hmm. Well, we've made that commitment so that we are around the people that understand us, but then it also does not, it, it keeps us going to where we're not pulled back into the old way of life. Yeah. And so I have virtually shook hands with somebody that says, hey, we're going to be there. You can count on us. Mm -hmm. And that helps a lot too. And we know way in advance, at least what months <laughs> that, yeah. you know, we know spring and, and fall what to, what to do. And, um, and that's helped us tremendously. And we would have never met folks like you and unless we just stepped out. I didn't even know what Overland was until Robert was like, I think we should go to, oh, where was it? It was out west, Robert, was our first. Out west, in, yeah, Mormon Lake. Oh, okay. Yeah. The last time that when they it, had Mormon. The, uh, Bloverland, when that yeah. was blowing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's a good point. Uh, forcing ourselves to go to these things. This is not in my personality to go to Overland Expo if um, Graham Jackson hadn't asked me to do some training before Overland Expo started uh, for a company. It was kind of a division of Overland Journal called Overland Training. And I, I don't know about this. And he's like, well, you, you offer it all the time. You know how to do all this stuff. I need you to help me train. And then when this started, he said, okay, you're going to, you're going to teach it this. Uh, but everything in me was, no, I don't want to be up in front of people, public speaking. A lot of what it is to be the social media Overlander is not what I want, not who I am. But, it's interesting that we all force ourselves to go and as soon as you're there, you're glad you went and you're meeting so many amazing people and it's all worthwhile. But on paper you see 10,000 or like this year at West, what I guess it was 22,000, some huge numbers. of people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I do not want to be around a crowd that big and I am not into all the gear. This is not an event for me, but if you just go, you will find the people who are like you and who sort of almost, unwillingly show up and then as soon as they're there they're glad they went too and i think there's this big group of us thousands of us frankly it's the biggest gathering of introverts in the world you know <laughs> <laughs> agreeing to talk to each other for a while you know so some of these events even if they seem unlikely to be your thing um 
give it a shot and, and just see if you meet some like-minded people that can sort of help you along the way and uh, help you do whatever the next crazy trip or scheme is that you're, you're trying to do. Well, thank you guys. Thank you both. And yeah, thank you. Yeah. It's been great talking to you. Yeah. Yes. Um, first time we've had, a, you know, this long to talk um, yeah. <laughs> and, and in a quiet place actually. So, right. and we wish you all the well wishes for going back down um, meeting up with your vehicle and we look forward to your your adventures on YouTube on the YouTubes <laughs> <laughs> and um, uh, keep it up we we look forward to seeing you next time I don't think it'll be you'll be coming up for Overland West or Overland East uh, we don't know um, we'll see new ownership and we never know what's going to change so um, we may be coming up for East and then um, hopefully work in West next year. But a lot of big changes, I think, uh, after this last expo. So we just, we hope just we're, don't hope we're for on the, the call list. <laughs> yeah. You guys well, will keep us company in the car as we drive. We listen to the podcast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, uh, this year, uh, Robert is, has signed up for some really specialized leather working classes in Indiana. No, cool. Right before uh, Expo. And then I have a conference in St. Louis the right after. Like, we need to be there in St. Louis on that Sunday of the, uh, of the Expo. So it's like, wow. well, this time we're going to be missing Expo East. Yeah. Um, yep. and, not, and not signing up to volunteer. But we're super excited. Robert's been getting a lot of interest in his leatherworking um hunting bags those yeah uh, i love those i see all the pictures and they're awesome well i get to try them out as purses <laughs> before he sells them who are you <laughs> <laughs> i was like oh yeah. let me let me i need a bag i need a purse today robert <laughs> like you're not going to sell this one i like it or actually, yeah. I'm out and about, and somebody compliments, and I say, "Oh, well, that's two hundred and fifty dollars. If you want it, I'll take it." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm just modeling it today, but here yeah. you go. Well, okay. if we don't uh, see you there, maybe next Expo West or when we get home, uh, we're hoping to yeah. hit the road and be doing a lot of traveling around. So this will be if we don't come back for East, it'll be the first Expo ever that I haven't worked. Wow. Yeah. Okay. And. I will probably be asking your advice on, on other overland events that we'd like to try and that yeah. you might have gone to and, and everything. I think I think Robert would be good at training um, ham stuff. Yeah. Yep. I think there's a definite potential for all that. The ones we were just at in uh, Washington and British Columbia up by Whistler there. Mm -hmm. um, no, just so communication uh, up off-road communications, you know, beyond the local CB citizens van radio. Yes. Type stuff. There's a huge, the amount of plates that were um, ham radio license yeah, numbers up in BC was, PC was crazy. <laughs> I'd say almost half the attendees plates were the ham radio plate for Canada. So, and I think they have a reciprocal. And, and the things that you can do with ham radio now, it's not just, you know, talk. You can yeah. do, you know, digital, you can do APRS tracking, you can do yeah. uh, email through HF radio. So you send pictures. It's, it's crazy what you can yeah. do with it now. No, it's, and I'm barely scratching the service, but as soon as I heard people making phone calls on a Digipeter and um, then when we saw APRS, we were having trouble getting it to work in the foreign countries, but in the U.S. it was tracking us perfectly. Even down in Baja, mm -hmm. we'd ping off a tower mm -hmm. somewhere, probably in San Diego, but we for us, it's a huge part of it, especially for U.S., Canada traveling. Yeah. Yeah. Something to look forward to then. Yep. Awesome. Right. Well, thanks again, and we hope to be talking with you again really, really soon. Sounds yeah, good. Thank Keep you. Keep posting so we can uh, live vicariously through you guys as well, and uh, we'll, well talk to you as we, we're We will. Done. Yep. All righty. Appreciate it, guys. Thanks, guys. Thank you. You'd be all right. You'd be safe. All right. You too. Talk to you later. Bye. All righty. Bye-bye. Well, there you have it. I hope that you enjoyed the episode. 
Tim and Kelsey are wonderful people, and I'm excited to continue watching their adventures there on YouTube. That's right. And don't forget to follow us if you're so inclined to do so. Yeah, we're everywhere, too. We've got Been there YouTube. doing that. Been Dot there. com. YouTube. Instagram. Instagram. Facebook. Yeah, all of that. Jazz. All the good stuff. Until next time. We'll catch you later. Later.